morning. We're glad you are here with us worshiping this morning. Let's stand and sing with us. Sing this with me. I know a place where we can go to lay the troubles down in your soul. seated. Good morning. Uh, I mentioned in the eight o'clock service that we're not going to have to go very far to go down to the river. <laughs> so we're, uh, thank you team, that was a great start off. I am here to, this morning to give us a little more of a kickoff and a little more information on what's going to be happening with our capital campaign. You see our new logo. We uh, we've got that up there. So this is this is our start on really getting serious about uh, putting out information, giving you all the information we possibly can, and so you can make an informed decision and figure out where you want to fit in, how we're going to go, and how we're going to do all this. Uh, raise our funds for our new building. So if you probably got one of these today and you, there are some things on the back on the one side of it that tell you some upcoming events I'm here today to introduce you to some of the campaign uh, team managers or team uh, leaders so there's a picture up there on the wall uh, you'll notice the really good-looking person and me <laughs> just start with uh, I <laughs> I am the general chairperson, in, also with Chase Burns on the right side. So we will be uh, kind of in overlooking everything that's going on, along with some other people that are in, involved with it. 
on our spiritual emphasis team uh, would be Jeannie Barber. You see Jeannie's picture up there, right, top center. Uh, Jeannie will be uh, conducting several uh, different prayer uh, things that will be going on. Some will be a prayer um, day, a prayer vision, a prayer, uh, prayers, lots of prayers. Uh, speaking of which, 7 o'clock tonight. Oh, 7, I'm sorry. 5 o'clock, thank you. 5 o'clock tonight, we will meet out here at the uh, back in the inner room. If the inner room will hold us, if it won't hold us, we'll come out here. Um, but um, if you can't come out at 5 o'clock here, take some time at 5 o'clock and pray for us and with us in regards to this uh, upcoming events. Okay, our uh, next team is the uh, communications team. Uh, that is going to be handled mostly in our office. We have a office team up here. There's Luke. Where's Pam? Down the bottom. Down the bottom. Okay. So she will be, those two will be the ones that are going to handle our communications. Um, the next one will be our arrangements team, Vivian Kopp. Vivian's top, uh, top in the middle, right? Vivian will be taking care of um, our arrangements. Uh, all good Baptists like to eat and have coffee. So they, uh, Vivian and her team, which is pretty much made up of the hospitality team and a few others, they will be uh, taking care of getting things uh, together when we have meetings uh, in regards to snacks and refreshments along those lines. Our uh, presentation team, that's Kevin. He's alongside Pam right there. Uh, Kevin will be uh, leading his group, and they will be coming to Sunday school classes, small groups, and different uh, areas along those lines giving us the information and getting the information out to each in individuals in small group situations. Okay. And then we have uh, a reminder team. We all know, or no, here's me, uh, we don't all know. Some of us don't have good memories anymore. <laughs> so we have a team to remind you uh, that we have a special event coming up and you've signed up for it or maybe you're on the list and haven't signed up yet, and they will be calling you. And Rhonda McKinley, uh, her team will be gently reminding you to, uh, of the events coming up and the ones that you need to be at, if possible. Uh, uh, our creative gifts team. This is a special team. Uh, Mike uh, Sponsler and Clint Huffstetler are the ones heading that up, and they will be conducting a seminar, uh, giving you an idea of maybe a long-term or short-term idea of how to uh, donate or give uh, to the church tax-wise, things that will help along those lines. We all know we like to take care of the internal revenue service as we do this. So uh, they will be showing us some things in regards to that, uh, what, how it would fit in, and they will be leading that team. Uh, finally, I think I got them all, except for me and Blake Berry are going to be on the advanced challenge team. And that's the one that we're kicking it off. And the next two weeks, we're going to be getting busy with that, uh, getting things out in front so we can start uh, getting information to you guys. There are going to be a couple of big informational meetings come up and you will be, should be contacted somewhere along the line as to those two dates. Uh, they will give us a whole lot of information as to what's going on. I know there's a lot of questions. We haven't had a real good question and answer period yet. Uh, those times are coming and we're going to uh, get started this next week after next, mostly on that. So. I think that covered everything I've got. Luke? Good. Okay. Thank you. Continue to, uh, <laughs> we'll continue to keep praying uh, for the capital campaign team. Uh, we want to lift them up with, with the wisdom and, and the ability that God has given each one of them. Uh, we also want to lift up two other uh, groups this week. 
Uh, we have Men's Momentum going this Saturday or this weekend to uh, Life Action Camp Friday. Is that what it is? Friday. And we have 21 guys going, so we want to lift those guys up who are going. Uh, we also want to lift up the El Salvador mission trip that's going, that is going Saturday. So we want to lift them up and make sure uh, to just pray over them. And so let's join together as a church family does and pray. Father, thank you so much uh, for your wisdom and for your love, for each one of the people who are part of the Capital Campaign uh, team, Lord, that you've designed and put them in places uh, you've so um, uh, just designed for them, Lord. And so, Lord, we thank you so much for the way you, you instilled wisdom in them and uh, each one of their skills, God, would you use them for your glory. Uh, we just pray over them, Lord. Would you uh, just give them so much of your desire and your dream um, for this church and, and where you're taking it, Lord. Uh, we just ask... Uh, Lord, as a church body, that we just love them and pour over them and, and help them as much as we can, uh, Lord. And so, Lord, would you just instill in them so much of your vision and your, uh, your desire for this church to grow. And, Lord, we just pray for each one of these groups who are going this weekend. We pray for men's momentum. Uh, for the 21 guys who are going, Lord, would you just, in, just pour into each one of their lives, Lord. Um, if they know you, would they grow closer to you, Father? Uh, and if they don't know you, Lord, would they come to know you um, through that event, uh, Lord? Um, events don't save people. Um, speakers don't save people, Lord. You do. And so, Lord, I just pray, would you just pour into these guys' heart? Would you um, open uh, their hearts to humility? Would you allow them to uh, change for your glory, Lord? And, Lord, we just pray for the El Salvador mission trip, Lord. Would you just protect them? Would you give them so much of your grace and your strength through that time? Would you allow the travel to go um, so well and, and easy, Lord? Would there no be, be no hiccups? Um, in it, Lord, uh, we just thank you so much for the ability to go out and to serve others. And I just pray uh, for the people that we're serving, Lord, would we share so much of your love uh, and your truth with them, Father. And Lord, we just ask all these things in your name. Amen. Grab your bulletins and let's watch these video announcements. Good morning, church family. Welcome home. Whether you're joining us here in the sanctuary or listening online through Facebook, the website, or WRMJ, we're so glad to be in fellowship with you here this morning. And what a great Easter weekend we had. It was wonderful. We want to take a moment and thank everyone who brought candy, volunteered, or participated in our family Easter event. And did I hear we had close to 400 people at the event? We sure did. We heard the gospel. We got tons of candy blasted from those candy launchers. We fed lunch to 350 people. It was an amazing day. Thank you again to everyone that helped make that event possible. All glory to God and on to today's announcements. Hey, good morning, students and families. So thankful to be worshiping with you guys. Here are your refuge announcements. April 27th, there is a Boom Sisters event here. All 6th to 12th grade girls, you guys are invited to come here from 10 a.m. to 12.30 p.m. watching the movie Hidden in Silence. And there's no sign up, just show up. And lastly, for you guys, CIY registrations are open currently. CIY moved for high schoolers going to Bowling Green State University June 22nd to the 28th. Cost is $200 per student. You must sign up and sign the EMRF form, so please sign up as soon as possible. And CIY Mix for junior hires going to Holland, Michigan this year at Hope College July 28th through August 1st. Cost is $190 per student. You must sign up online, sign up the EMRF. Please sign up as soon as you can. All right, students and families, see you guys at Refuge tonight. Does your family have a 2024 graduate? If someone from your family is graduating from eighth grade, high school, or college, please complete today's Connect card or call the office by April 24th so we can add them to the graduate recognition list. Grad Recognition Sunday at FBC is May 26th at 10.15 a.m. The deadline to sign up for the Journey Mother-Daughter Retreat at Life Action Camp is April 10th. See your bulletin for details for this retreat, which is April 26th through the 28th in Buchanan, Michigan. Recommended for moms with daughters ages 7 through 13. Cost is $100 per mom and $50 per daughter. Sign up online. The ladies of the church are invited to a baby shower for Cherylee Von Zumeren this Saturday, April 13th at 2 p.m. in Fellowship Hall. Cherylee is registered at walmart.com. RSVP to Beth Bounds. The FBC Men's Ministry is sponsoring a fun trivia night on May 4th from 5 to 8 p.m. This event is open to everyone ages 13 and up, and there will be 10 rounds of questions with categories such as the Bible, Star Wars, sports, music, literature, 80s, and more. Bring your own snacks and have a blast with a team you form of up to eight people or sign up and we'll find a team for you. Registration is open at firstbaptistledo.com. 
And finally, if you have a prayer concern, the FBC prayer team would love to pray for you. If you are present in the sanctuary, there are prayer cards in the seat pockets in front of you. You can submit those by dropping them in the prayer card box in the lobby. Or if you're watching from home, email us from our website, firstbaptistledo.com. Your tithes and offerings can be left in the white offering boxes found in the lobby or at the sanctuary exit doors. If you are a current donor or are interested in learning how to give online, please visit our website at firstbaptistledo.com. Thanks again for joining us. And have a blessed day of worship. This next song is such a good reminder of the many, many blessings that the Lord has given us, that he continues to give us, that he's so, so good to each and every one of us, that he's always faithful. Let's stand and let's just show him our thankfulness right now for that. I was blind, now I'm seeing in color. I was dead, now I'm living forever. I had failed, but you were my redeemer. I've been blessed beyond all measure. I was lost, now I'm found by the Father. I've been changed from a ruin to treasure. I've been given a hope and a future. I've been blessed beyond all measure. And I am counting every blessing, counting every blessing, letting go and trusting when blessing surely every season you are good to me oh, oh, oh you are good to me oh, oh, oh you are good to me you were there in the valley of shadows you were there in the depth of my sorrows you're my strength trusting when I
Mustang around. God turn it around. God turn it around. God turn it around. I'm calling on the name that changes everything. God turn it around. God turn it around. God turn it around. All of my hope is in the name, the name of Jesus. Breakthrough will come, come in the name, the name of Jesus. I'm praying God come and turn this thing around. Turn it around, God, turn it around. I'm calling on the name that changes everything. God, turn it around, God, turn it around, God, turn it around. something God is doing something right now he is up to something he is up to something God is doing something right now he is healing someone he is saving someone God is doing something right now he is healing someone he is saving someone Something right now, he is moving mountains, making a way for someone. God is doing something. so thankful that you are the God of the turnaround. You are the God of the healing, the God of the saving, the God of wisdom, the God of refuge, the God of strength, the God of power, the God of love. And we thank you that we get to be here in this place with you in fellowship with each other, proclaiming that you are are good, you are always faithful, you are always true, and you provide us with your Holy Spirit that equips and enables, Lord, and we just pray that you would fill Pastor Luke with your Holy Spirit this morning, that it would overflow in power and in truth, Lord, and that we would be 
so receptive and eager and longing for your word to penetrate our hearts and our minds, that we would walk away from this place excited and ready to speak your word to every person we come across in this community, Lord, to let your, your truth ring true, that it is our foundation, that it never moves, that it never changes. Lord, we thank you, we love you, and we pray all these things in the precious name of your son, Jesus, this morning. Amen. 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 Good morning. I cannot see you, but I think you're, you're probably there. I heard you. Um, we're, we're still in our lesser known uh, stories series, and um, this lesser known story is about the queen, it's Athaliah, the queen of the Jews, the one queen uh, of Israel or Judah um, that most people don't really know much about. Um, But her story actually begins at the end of a pretty famous uh, Old Testament story that a lot of people are pretty aware of, which is uh, Elijah and Mount Carmel and the two sacrifices. We're we're pretty familiar with that story. Um, But what was happening was Elijah is called by God to begin to prophesy or to judge or to bring discipline to Ahab. Um, as he and Jezebel are the the rulers of Israel, the northern kingdom of Israel. And so they have this showdown on Mount Carmel with the two sacrifices. God supernaturally burns up the sacrifice of of Elijah. But then what happens is he uh, is threatened by Jezebel that she's going to kill him. And so he runs away from Mount Carmel. Uh, He goes down to Beersheba, and then from there he goes to Mount Sinai, which is you know, between Egypt and Israel, he's there kind of waiting to hear from God. Remember this story? Is this familiar to you? And then he goes, this is, this is still pretty famous. He, he's on Mount Sinai, and uh, God begins to speak to him, right? And so he brings the earthquake, and it says God's not in the earthquake, and he brings the, 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 um, the wind, God's not in the wind, God's, and then there's fire, and God's not in the fire, and then there's a gentle whisper. And he, he's okay. He puts on his robe and he goes out to the entrance of the cave and, and he, he begins to have this conversation with God. He's like, I, you know, I did all this for you and, and uh, all the things that I thought were going to happen and, and now they're trying to kill me and I'm the only prophet left, and, right? And, and God says, you're not the only one left. I have plenty more. But here's the thing. Um, we kind of stop there with that conversation and we miss what it is that God actually is prophesying and promising and, and commanding from the end of that story. And, and, but all of the things that happened transpired in those famous stories culminates down to this one thing that God says to Elijah. He says, here's what I want you to do. Does anybody remember what, what he says to Elijah? Here's what I want you to do. He says, I want you to go and anoint Hazel or Probably if it, you know, we were being a little more authentic, it'd be Hazael, you know, but we're Americans, so we're going to say Hazel. And anyway, Hazel is going to become the king of Syria or Aram. So Syria is north of Israel, um, and they're in this battle with with Israel, okay? But it's, in those days, it was called Aram, and these are the Arameans. So I want you to anoint Hazel, king of Aram. And I want you to anoint Jehu, who is going to become king of Israel. And I want you to anoint Elisha, who is going to become your replacement. So here's, here's the plan. Whoever Hazel doesn't kill, Jehu's going to kill. Whoever ha- Jehu doesn't kill, then Elisha's going to kill. Like we're going we're gonna to bring judgment on the house of Ahab for all the wickedness and evil that he and, and Jezebel have instituted in Israel. And that whole story is ultimately, over the years, fulfilled in Athaliah and her reign in Judah. You want to know how we get from there to there? Yeah? Okay, good. Because I don't have anything else for you. So, all right. Let's uh, pick it up in 2 Kings chapter 11. Let's stand as we read God's Word this morning, 2 Kings 11. 
Now, don't get lost in all the names. There are going to be a lot of names that are hard to pronounce. I'm probably not pronouncing them correctly. I am hooked on phonics. They're just phonetically, this is how I read them, okay? If you say them differently, you don't have to remember them all, but here's what it says. Now, when Athaliah, the mother of Ahaziah, saw that her son was dead, she arose and destroyed all the royal family. But Jehosheba, the daughter of King Joram, sister of Ahaziah, took Joash, the son of Ahaziah, and stole him away from among the king's sons who were being put to death, and she put him and his nurse in a bedroom. Thus they hid him from Athaliah so that he was not put to death. And he remained with her six years, hidden in the house of the Lord, while Athaliah reigned over the land." Father, we thank you for your word and your promises and your ultimate provision, Lord, of salvation through your son Jesus, that this uh, story and all the things that transpire um, are fulfilled ultimately in Jesus, uh, that you promised to bring about um, the the Savior of the world through the line of David, and uh, our enemy had a, a different plan, but He was not able to fulfill his plan. Um, And so we thank you, Lord, that you are always going to fulfill your plan. You're going to complete and uh, and conclude and fulfill everything that you have told us about what the future of the world is, who we are, um, what our uh, ultimate uh, destiny is, Lord, with you in heaven. And uh, God, we thank you for showing us uh, the prophecies and the and the fulfillment of these things throughout the Old Testament, that we have more and more confidence uh, that the things that were past have come to be, and the things that are future will come to be. And uh, we have a place in that through faith in Jesus. And so, uh, God, would you give us wisdom, give us understanding, insight, um, inspiration, strength uh, to be able to continue to follow, continue to follow you strongly, faithfully, um, for your glory that we might have a place in your continued plan for this world um, in the days ahead, in our generation. And we thank you that uh, you have more to do and more for us to do. And so we're giving you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You can be seated. So you may wonder, how do we get from Elijah to Athaliah? Um, So here's what happens. You got to understand, Elijah in his day was confronting Ahab. Ahab's the king of Israel. Um, And then you have a southern kingdom of Israel that we call Judah. And why we call it Judah, some of you know because we've said this before, uh, is because the prominent and primary tribe of that land was the tribe of Judah. And in fact, there are only two tribes that were in that southern part. It was Judah and Benjamin, and then kind of the tribe of Levi, but Levi was spread out all, all over the place. And so it becomes the, the land of Judah because it's, that's the prominent tribe of that place. Anyway, that's neither here nor there. Uh, but it's a divided kingdom. But in that time, Ahab is ruling in the northern part, and he's powerful, and he has Jezebel in his ear with all kinds of wicked schemes, instituting Baal worship, the worship of idols and false gods and all the rest, and they're doing all kinds of, uh, of evil, wicked, horrible, terrible, ungodly things, okay? And so they're influencing not only Israel but also Judah because there's a king in, in southern Israel or, or Judah who is called uh, Jehoshaphat. How, you, and why do we not use these names anymore? I don't know. But <laughs> Jehoshaphat is the king in Judah, and he and Ahab are buddies, kind of. They're they're partnering together in different kinds of campaigns and warfare and different things. Um, And so there's an agreement between these two. Even though Jehoshaphat is primarily a good guy and a good king, he's being influenced by uh, Ahab and his dynasty and his family. So what happens ultimately is that Elijah thinks that he is going to bring an end to Ahab and all the evil that's happening, but that's not necessarily going to be something that he sees fulfilled in his time. Ahab dies, okay? He's in a, a battle with Syria or Aram, and he gets shot. It was, he's just kind of, 
He's just a, a fighter. He's out fighting. He's in disguise. They don't really know that he's the king, but somebody randomly just shoots him with an arrow, and he dies. Okay, and so um, what happens then is that his son, uh, Joram, becomes king in Israel. Jehoshaphat also dies eventually, and what happens is that his son, Jehoram, don't you love this? His son becomes king in Judah. So you got Joram in Israel, and you have Jehoram in Judah. You got that so far? Who's taking notes? Okay, so Jehoram is not a good guy, okay? In fact, he's such not a good guy that God inflicts him with an intestinal disease to the extent, the Bible says, and this is, there's a lot of gruesome stuff in this story, okay? So um, I don't know if the little kids, this is a great day. We got the second through fifth graders in our Sundays, in, the, in our worship because uh, they're not downstairs today. So you get all the gory details. His guts, it says, come out. Use your imagination. I don't know exactly how they come out or where, but his guts come out, and that's how he dies. Okay? That's, so um, Jehoram is dead. Jehoram is married to Athaliah. Athaliah, it says in the Bible that she is Omri's granddaughter. Who's Omri? Anybody know? That is Ahab's father. So here's what we kind of try to pick up here is that we don't think that probably Ahab and Jezebel are the parents of Athaliah. We think that probably since she is said to be the granddaughter of Omri, that she's probably the niece of Ahab. She's in the royal family. She's just not like probably directly related by birth according to you know, their, their daughter. But she's in the royal family. She's a niece of Ahab. And she's been married off to the king of Judah. So what we begin to understand is that Israel, evil, wicked, idolatrous Israel, Jezebel primarily, is influencing Judah through marriage, through all these relationships. And Athaliah, she's married to the king of Israel, or the king of Judah, Jehoram. And then he dies because he's been influenced by her and Jezebel. Because he, he's, he's not a good guy. He dies, and then their son, Ahaziah, becomes king. Okay, you got that so far? Ahaziah becomes king, and Ahaziah um, is basically kind of like cousins with Joram up in Israel. And so they partner together, and they do a lot of stuff. They're buddies, and they're, they're doing warfare, and they're doing all kinds of stuff. So he's going up to Israel all the time and partnering with Joram in whatever plans and, and schemes and fights and battles that Joram's got going on. So pause that for a second. Then you have um, Elisha, who's the, the one who's been anointed by Elijah to take over the prophetic ministry. Elijah, remember Elijah goes up to heaven in a whirlwind? Okay, there's... Some people say he, he goes up to heaven in the chariots of fire, but the chariots of fire, um, just being technical here, they actually just divide Elisha from Elijah, and so that Elisha doesn't, so Elisha is here, and Elijah's here, the chariots of fire go in the middle, and then a whirlwind takes Elijah up to heaven uh, in kind of a, a rapture. He goes to heaven without dying. Okay, so Elisha He's taking over the prophetic ministry, and what he does, he goes to Damascus, which is up in Aram or Syria, right? So while he's there, there's a king in Aram named Ben-Hadad, okay? Ben-Hadad is sick. He's got some kind of whatever, illness, ailment, whatever, and he's like, his doctors aren't telling him what's going on. I guess they don't have really great medical, you know, things going on there. So he's like, uh, there's a prophet in town, Hazel. Go find out if I'm going to survive my illness. Remember Hazel? Now Hazel, just kind of one of his soldiers or whatever, he's like, okay, I'll go talk to Elisha, see if you're going to survive. And so he goes to Elisha, and, he, and Elisha says, um, Ben-Hadad will survive his illness. Nevertheless, he will die. And Hazel's like, uh, I'm not quite getting that. And so Elisha 
begins to stare intently into Hazel's face so much that Hazel begins to kind of get almost like freaked out. He's like, what are you looking at? And so Elisha says, and he begins to weep, and he says, I'm just overwhelmed by all the death and destruction that you're going to cause in Israel. You're going to slaughter all these people. You're, I mean, the details are really gross. I won't even go there. So, and so Hazel's like, how could I do such a wonderful thing? I mean, he's like, I, I'm just the soldier in the army. You're, how, how am I going to accomplish all this? And Elisha tells him, you will become the king of Aram. So he says, hmm, interesting. He goes back to Ben-Hadad, and Ben-Hadad's like, what happened? What did Elisha say? He said, you will certainly survive your illness. He's like, hooray. And then the next day, Hazel takes a wet pillow and suffocates Ben-Hadad and kills him. (laughs) And he becomes king. So now Hazel's king of of, uh, Aram, and Joram and uh, Ahaziah, they go to battle against Hazel, and Hazel, or one of his soldiers, whatever, shoots Joram with an arrow, but doesn't kill him, just kind of wounds him, maybe, maybe in the arm or something, I don't know. So what happens is Joram goes back home to recover, he's uh, getting, you know, some chicken noodle soup, and, and uh, sitting in the recliner watching Survivor, that's what I would do, and so <laughs> he's just chilling out. And what happens is that meanwhile, okay, Ahaziah is like visiting him and patting him on the back and rubbing his feet and whatever. And so over here, uh, Elisha sends a prophet to go anoint Jehu to become king of Israel. So this is just like, hey, go, go find Jehu and anoint him king. And so he runs around, I mean, literally like running around looking for Jehu, finds him in a Mexican bar and grill where he's eating chips and salsa. And I mean, not literally, but kind of like this. This is how I picture it. So he is there and here comes the prophet and he's like, hey, I got a message for you. And he says, okay, so uh, let's pull him aside, go into the back room and what's the message? And he says, you, he pours oil on his head and says, you're going to be king of Israel and you are, God has told you to judge the house of Ahab. And he's like, okay. And then, like, he, before he can even turn around, the prophet, like, opens the door and runs away. Like, Forrest Gump, just, like, running. <laughs> like, I mean, this is what the Bible says. It's like, he's like, what, what just happened here? And he goes out to his guy scratching his head, and they're like, what, what, is, what was that all about? And he says, well, you know these prophets and how they are. I mean, that's what he says. And they're like, um... No, well, tell us, what, what happened? And he says, well, he anointed me with oil and said, I'm a king of Israel. And they just literally at that moment, like put their, their coat, coats down on the ground and robes and all this stuff, and they say, hey, oh, king of Israel. I mean, they're like taking it seriously. And he's like, okay, if we're serious about this, guys, then we got work to do, and don't tell anybody, and let's go. And so they get in their chariots, and they start making a beeline for uh, Joram. And so remember, Joram and Ahaziah, they're, you know, over there, like, rubbing each other's shoulders and whatever. And so they look out the window, and they see, like, this group coming towards them. And like, what, what's that all about? I'm going to skip over some stuff. But so they're like, that's got to be Jehu, because he drives his chariot like a madman. And so Jehu had this reputation for being fast and furious 800 B.C., Okay. He's just like pedal to the metal and just reckless driving his... They're like, here comes Jehu. What? So Jehu is like an officer in, in Joram's army, right? So he's like, well, what's going on here? So they go out and they meet Jehu and they're like, do you come in peace? And he says, how can there be peace when that woman Jezebel is still alive? And that's, remember, that's Joram's mom. He's like, oh, he starts freaking out, and he turns his chariot around and starts riding away. And so does Ahaziah, and Joram takes aim and shoots him in the back and kills him. Joram's dead. Ahaziah, king of Judah now, this is not king of Israel, but he's like, hey, kill that guy too. So one of his guys shoots Ahaziah. Ahaziah doesn't die right away, but he's shot, you know, fatally. He just takes him a little while to die. 
And so now Ahaziah is dead. Now Ahaziah was the son of uh, Athaliah, remember? So that's, <laughs> you got it, right? Athaliah's son is dead. So she's going to take over control of the kingdom. Her husband's dead. Her son's dead. We'll get back to that in a second. So meanwhile, up in Israel, what's going on, Jehu, as the new king, he's going to start cleaning house and judging the house of Ahab. So first thing is what? Jezebel. Here's Jezebel, third story window, taunting uh, Jehu. (laughs) Why? Anyway, so he's like, hey, anybody up there on my side? A couple of eunuchs. Toss her out the window, okay, third story. Apparently, what I don't know if this is a stockyard or what, but there's a bunch of horses down there, and they trample her. I don't, the fall probably killed her anyway, but the horses trample her. It gets gross. I mean, that's not even the gross part. So dogs come, and they eat her body. The only thing left is her hands and her head. And this is a prophecy of, the, of Scripture that says that there will be nothing left of her to bury, to even say this was Jezebel. That's, that's the judgment of God on her because of the evil that she had instituted, not just in, in Israel, but also in Judah and all over the place. Evil, evil woman. And God put an end to that. So now Jehu is uh, in control. He's got the kingdom in his hands, and he, but he's, he's a shrewd guy. So he sends a message to the elders of a, a city or place where the sons of Ahab are being kept or live, or I don't know exactly what, but there's 70 sons of Ahab. Apparently, he had more than just one wife. So he has 70 sons over here, and he says, hey, go ahead and make one of those sons of Ahab king. And these guys are like... You know, they're quaking in their boots like, uh, no, 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 you're king, Jehu. What, what do you want us to do? So he says, all right, I, I want their heads. So 70 sons of Ahab, they all get beheaded, and they take these heads to Jehu, and he piles up two, two piles of heads uh, at the city gates. And he says, okay, I killed, um, Je- I killed Jer- Joram, I killed Jezebel, but who killed these? And what he's saying is, um, listen, Israel is in my control, and here's what we're going to do. And they're going to begin to um, exact vengeance, discipline, whatever you want to call it, judgment on the, the worshipers of Baal. And so they gather all the priests of Baal in this little, there's a whole thing here, okay? I don't know if you want to get into all of it, but they get this, all the priests of Baal into the, the temple of Baal. And uh, they kill them all. Okay. Pretty simple. Now, the other thing that's happening, though, is that, remember, Ahaziah is there visiting Joram, right? Well, he's got a bunch of his own, you know, relatives there with him, 42 of them. And uh, Jehu says, kill those guys, too. So now you have all the the house of Ahab has been judged. Then you have the beginning of of a, a decimation of all the, the house of David, not included in, in, the, in the judgment of, of Ahab's household or, or dynasty. So Athaliah is down in Judah, and she is hearing the reports, and all these things have happened, and all those... those and here's the deal... All those people were her relatives. The house of Ahab, she, she had more alignment with them in her family and in her heart. That she had a, a sense of, of uh, confirmation in her heart that, that what they were doing was what she wanted to do. And she wanted to see that happen in Israel. And so what she begins to do is she begins a mockery of God's judgment by actually instituting her own satanic judgment on the house of David. And so she kills all of her grandchildren so that nobody could contend for the throne. She wants control of the throne. Now, 
Satan had already been working in this whole situation because remember her, her husband, Jehoram, when he became king, he executed all of his brothers, killed them all. And then he was king for like seven or eight years. Um, somehow or other, the, uh, there were some Arabian invaders that came into Israel and they killed Jehoram's oldest sons. So Ahaziah was the youngest of his sons, and he was the only survivor. So you got to picture this, okay? Um, God has said that the, the Messiah, the one who would defeat Satan, would be from the, the line of David. Remember this? He says that you will always have a, a, somebody to sit on the throne. And so... Throughout human history, it began back in Genesis that God had declared that there would be a Messiah who would crush the head of Satan. You would strike his heel, but he will crush your head. And so Satan begins this attack on the human race. Then God kind of clarified that it's not just going to be any human being. It's going to be from the Jewish people. So Satan begins an attack on the Jewish people particularly. And then God kind of whittled it down. He says, it's not just going to be from any of the Jewish people. It's going to be from the house and the line of David. So Satan begins to attack the house and the line of David specifically. And at this moment in history, okay, when Athaliah is the queen of the Jews, she has effectively demolished almost all of of the house of David. Like it's down to like one little one-year-old baby is it. That's the only one left. And what had happened was that Jehoram had a sister, Jehosheba. You all getting this? Jehosheba somehow was not in line and in in cahoots with all the evil and wickedness of, of the house of Ahab and all the things that Jehoram was doing and all the rest of it. She married a priest um, who was uh, Jehoash. No, her her. Her guy was named, um, oh, what's his name? (laughs) Whatever. (laughs) I knew I'd forget one of them eventually. So Jehosheba um, is married to a priest, and he um, is part of this whole plan to um, cap, not capture, but rescue this baby, Jehoash, or Joash. Joash um, is this one-year-old little baby that apparently got forgotten about. Nobody knew where he was or couldn't find him when they were trying to kill everybody. And so he got saved. He was in this little bedroom with the nurse. And then when the coast was clear, they took little baby Joash and got him to the temple. And they kept him in the temple. And for six years, they raised him in the temple secretly. And then finally, when he was seven years old, he's primed and ready to become king of Israel, of course. Because we always make seven-year-olds kings, Right? So here's what happens is that uh, Jehosheba and uh, her husband, somebody have this? Jehoiada, thank you. Jehoiada and Jehosheba, they get together and they're like, here's what we do. Okay, here's what we're going to do. We get the army commanders, we get the Levites, and in secret, we're going to get the whole nation of Israel, and we're going to get them together, and we're going to declare that uh, Joash is king. We're going to set him by the pillar, because apparently the king is supposed to be by the pillar, and he's given the covenant, which is the law, and then we declare that we anoint him with oil, and he's the king of Israel. And so they're doing this, and then uh, Athaliah comes out of her palace and goes to the temple. She hears this whole commotion, and she's like, what's going on over here? And they're saying, Joash is king. And she says, treason. And then she runs away. And then um, Jehoiada says, don't kill her in the temple, but do kill her. (laughs) And so she gets to the horse gate of the palace, and they put her to death, and boom, she's done. And this little seven-year-old kid... Joash is now king of Israel and the hope of the savior of the world. Now, I don't know if you're thinking to yourself, what on earth is all that about? 
Okay, but here's what it's all about, is that God is certainly going to accomplish his plan. He will never fail to accomplish his plan. He's made promises. He has made prophecies. He has made guarantees that he will certainly fulfill. Amen? Amen. But two things. Number one, we do have an enemy who can cause a great deal of death and destruction and havoc. He's real. There's a lot of pain and suffering and evil that happens because he's actively at work causing all kinds of lies and deceit and misunderstanding and fear and all the rest of it. He's working. And also, too, God almost never, I say almost, almost never does what he's going to do without enlisting the help of faithful, believing people. You, you don't get a Joash to survive the death and destruction of an Athaliah without a Jehosheba and a Jehoiada who are right there with their life on the line, bravely securing and making sure that we can preserve this line because we believe the Messiah is going to come from somebody from this family. You say, the application for you and me is that we, we have a dark world that I think is almost every bit as dark and evil and <laughs> destructive as what we see in, in the Bible. I mean, we see so much death and deceit and darkness and lies, and it's, it is everywhere. Am I wrong? I, I don't think so. We can just sit back and say, well, God, will, he's going to handle it. He's going to take care of it. And he will. I mean, he's God. He's going to fulfill his plan to bring people into his kingdom and to judge the, the wickedness and the darkness of the world, especially the activity of his arch enemy, Satan, who is no match for him. But he has called you and me as believers, as faithful, obedient believers in Jesus Christ to be partners with him in his plan to help save as many people as we possibly can. Amen? Amen. Now, how do you do that? I mean, does that seem like a big task? Like insurmountable? <laughs> but here's what you know, I see in this story is something similar to what I see in our church is that you have, you have some faithful people with a safe place where you can bring people into and say, well, here's where the gospel can be heard. It, it is not complicated, okay? I mean, it's not easy, but it's not complicated. Every Sunday, we have a message of the gospel being proclaimed in this place. You have relationships with people. You have friends and family and people that you work with and people that you know that you could easily just say, hey, I'm going to be in that place at this time, and I would love for you to come and join me. That's not complicated. It may not be that you get every invitation accepted, but you might get a few. And every time that you put the message out there to anyone and, and someone that, hey, I'm going to be in this place at this time and you're welcome to join me, I'll save a seat for you, then that is a eternal and it is a cosmic event that's happening. That, <laughs> that you're part of God's plan to rescue somebody, and you don't know who it might be, you just keep getting the invitation out there, and we're going to keep preaching the word, and we're going to keep loving people and offering every ministry that we possibly can to disciple as many people as we possibly can. Amen? Amen. That's what we do. That's what it's all about. That's what this is about. And Father, we thank you that you're always moving and working and doing far more and beyond anything that we can imagine. And we give you praise for that, Lord. But you've called us. You have raised us up. You have empowered us to be part of that plan. Help us to find the courage. Help us to take it, whatever opportunity that you present to us, Lord. Help us to not back down. <laughs> Speak the truth in love for your glory, for people's sake, Lord. And if we have any question, 
in our own minds about who you are or what you're doing, Lord, I pray that we would not hesitate just to bring those questions to you. And you will confirm, because you always do, over and over, your grace, your love, and your power. But Lord, help us to go beyond just being saved, Lord. Help us to be part of your plan to save others for their sake. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I want to invite you this morning, as we're singing, um, the invitation is, who have I invited to church lately? Who have I invited to church lately? It doesn't have to be high pressure sales. It's just, man, I I love this church. (laughs) I'd love for you to come and and love it just as much as I do. I mean, it's as simple as that. Amen? Amen. But who have I invited lately? And if the Lord puts somebody on your heart, um, don't hesitate. (laughs) Just reach out to them. Let's stand and sing. Yeah.
again Cause all that I have is a hallelujah Hallelujah And I know it's not much But I'm nothing else fit for a king Except for a heart singing hallelujah Amen. You can clap if you want to. It's okay. Amen. All right. Well, you are free to go and have a blessed day.